The first thing that people pay much less attention to is the role of climate change in the Syrian conflict. So Syria is a country of about 22 million people. Uh, before 2011, and this is actually true of a lot of the Arab Spring, there was a tremendous drought in parts of the Middle East. Nine million of Syria's farmers moved into the cities because they could not support themselves on the land because of the drought, prolonged drought. Food prices went up also throughout the region. That combustible situation, so can you imagine, nine million people in the cities without enough to eat, without being able, not sustained by the cities? It's not surprising that you got the kind of combustible situation you found when the Arab Spring uh, broke out. Uh, but also simply the tremendous fraying of the social fabric when you have that kind of change very quickly. So climate change led to people flows uh, in ways uh, that, that helped lay the seeds uh, for the conflict uh, with the government. Once the conflict broke out, remember 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, tremendous refugee flows. We now pay much more attention to this because of what ultimately its impact on Western Europe. It, it actually played a large role in the Brexit vote in, in Great Britain, even though in many ways uh, th that was, there were not many Syrian refugees uh, in Britain. It tied into a larger narrative about not controlling your borders. And of course, we saw, we had, if you just think back two summers, you remember the, the pictures of refugees, Germany, uh, both in Hungary and in Greece, and finally uh, in Germany. But when we were thinking about the Syrian conflict initially, we were not thinking about the displacement of five, six, the external displacement of five or six million people, many of whom, of course, are still in camps uh, in Jordan uh, and Turkey. I told you I would talk about uh, different hotspots. We've looked at three uh, big ones, and in each case, We've talked about the geopolitical state-to-state -state view. And then I've pointed out different, what I would think of as networks or flows of people, of trade, of goods and services, digital flows, climate flows, energy flows, just to get started. When I look at the world, I'll just keep you waiting. I see two things. I see the chessboard and the web. The chessboard is the world that most of us study when we first study international relations. In this building, it is definitely more complex, but when you first encounter the world, you encounter a map, whether it's flat or a globe. And that map is full of brightly colored squares that we know as states, 194 of them. Generally, when you're studying global politics, it depends on the regions. You're studying the 20 great powers or the great power in a particular region. Now, you know, human beings created those lines, right? They're, <laughs> they're not there in terms of climate or people or many of the other things uh, that we think about. But that's the way we organize the world and how we structure world politics. That map is important. It'd be crazy to say that states don't matter. They matter enormously, uh, and their leaders matter. But the other map, just think about the world at night. And for those of you who watch Fareed Zakaria's show, I was just on it recently, and his backdrop is actually a backdrop of the world at night. And he said, I, was, I mentioned this to him, and he said, well, I trust you tell your audiences you think of Fareed Zakaria's backdrop. Well, if you watch Fareed, that's what you can think of. Many of us, though, think about that map. It's really fascinating. You do not see any squares. What you see are intense, lit up parts of the world, and then often little trails to other pieces, and then some parts that are very dark. Borders don't matter at all, but it is deeply networked. Some parts are so networked that they are all light. Others, you just see bits and nodes. It's the map of the internet. Indeed, if, we just th if you take any look at the internet, you will see similarly, or if you map different parts of the world in terms of how digitally connected they are, you'll see the same thing. You'll see some, in uh, you'll see some enormous hubs that are connected to everything, and you'll see others that are quite disconnected. Chessboard, 
that the reason we, when we talk about the world of states, I call it the chessboard. You could just call it the game board because those of you who know game theory know you can play chess, you can play chicken, you can play poker, you can play stag hunt. There are lots of different games, but most people think of chess masters, great statesmen, great stateswomen. We think of chess. The chessboard and then the web. And the web is a world of networks and flows. And what I want you to take away from this is that you must think about both, no matter what you're looking at. Both are essential. It is not either or. It is not, here. you know, we're moving back to the Middle Ages and states are disappearing. I don't believe that. I think states are here to stay for at least as long as, as I can foresee it. But I think they must share their space with the world of the web. And you need to learn how to look at any situation and ask, what are the state issues? And then what are the people issues or the trade issues or the digital connections uh, or the climate connections? So I've talked about hotspots. I've talked about how we tend to always focus on the simple world. It's not simple, but simpler world of states, of the immediate big powerful states in the region and to see states as caught between other states or fighting each other. The blind spots are much more around the flows of people and trade and, and energy and, and, uh, the di and digital flows. You might say, well, I knew that. That's just you know, state and non-state actors. We've been talking about that since the 1970s. I mean, you know, the Catholic Church and multinational corporations, and then certainly in the 1990s, we talked about non-governmental organizations and, and, and global uh, corporations. Fair enough. We have. It's not been news that there are non-state actors out there. But to paraphrase my, my friend Clay Shirky from NYU, talking about non-state actors is like calling an automobile a horseless carriage. And we're here in Michigan, so a horseless carriage. You are looking backward, not forward. You're saying what it isn't, not what it is. It is time that we think about the world in stereo as a world of states but also as a world of people and institutions and corporations and organizations, all of which are networked. This building houses centers that think of both. This building houses centers that can tell you a great deal about the complicated state politics of specific regions, but it also houses centers that can talk to you about the culture and the ethnography, which unfortunately, look back at the Kurds, does not track borders, about the economics, about the environment, about human rights. For Michigan students, for generations, who are going to be able to see the world in stereo, this is the place in the International Institute, in Weiser Hall, that they will learn to see both the chessboard and the web. Thank you very much.